Nikita Koloff, the Russian nightmare, no, the devil's nightmare here from It's Time to Man Up, challenging men to step into their true manhood. Your chosen Truth Network podcast is starting in just a few seconds. Enjoy it, share it, but most of all, thank you for listening to the Truth Podcast Network. This is the Truth Network. Coming to you from an entrenched barricade deep in the heart of Central North Carolina. Masculine Journey After Hours. A time to go deeper and be more transparent on the topic covered on this week's broadcast. So sit back and join us on this adventure. The Masculine Journey After Hours starts here now. Welcome to Masculine Journey After Hours. We're glad that you're with us this week. We are very content that you're here with us this week and we appreciate it and uh Anyway, we are talking about the topic of contentment, are we not, Harold? That's it's your topic yet again. Absolutely. Yeah, Mister Topic is what we're going to have to call you from now on. Yeah, we were we were looking for a topic, and it occurred to me that there's so much discontent in our world that it seems like most people are very unhappy about a lot of things mm-hmm. and or everything. We're, we're a divided country, uh, almost split down the middle. Seems like everybody wants to be in the majority and have things their way. And so when we're in the minority and having to live by the rules of the majority leads to discontent. Mm. So that was part of it is how how can we have contentment in the midst of things that are not what we want? Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to do the whole introduction like I did for the first show. Yeah, it seems like there should be some scripture or something there for it. <laughs> yeah, there was, a, there, was a, <laughs> there was there was quite a bit. It's like half the New Testament. <laughs> so, it was great. I'll just refer to Paul and, and his ability to be content in whatever state he found himself. Yeah. In fact, my sweetheart talks about that when we first moved to North Carolina. She was very unhappy about it, and she was reading that scripture and. She said, Lord, does that mean North Carolina? And it came back, absolutely. Now she loves it. Well, I was just giving you a hard time, Harold. You did an excellent job of setting up the first show and uh, with all the scripture that you had. And so I, I really appreciate you putting all that effort into it. So, you know, we just like to tease you like we always do. Of course. Yeah. Um, I would be discontented if you did. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, I actually, uh, I have the first clip uh, of this show. And... Uh, this is not a clips on contentment. It's it's the opposite. It's when life happens, and you get angry with God. And so, this is new for me. Not that topic because I've lived that topic in the past. But uh, um, this are both Christian movie clips, which I rarely use one, just because I don't watch a lot of Christian movies. Uh, not that I don't appreciate them, I just don't always enjoy them. And some I enjoy a lot, some not as much. But these are two clips. One's from called A Question of Faith is one of the, the, the first part of the clip you're going to hear. And what's happened here is you have a, a man who's supposed to be stepping into a role as a pastor and taking over a church, but he had a, he'd lost his son. And so the, the, the deacon or the person making that decision um, has, tells him that he's not going to get the church quite yet. And I want you to listen to that part of it. Then you'll transition into another story from a movie called Noble, in which a, a pregnant lady goes to a, uh, a place where nuns are, a nunnery, I guess you call it that. Um, Andy, you got a word for that one? Um, yeah, uh, what we'll think of it. It's a convent. Convent, thank you. Nunnery, I like that one. Um, anyway, uh, but when she goes, she doesn't realize she signed a thing saying that they can give her baby away. And so she finds out that her baby's been adopted. She didn't know it was going to happen. And what you hear is her actually talking to God, and I think it's interesting, and I'll come back and tell you why I played those clips. I'm going to suspend the installation service. Now. Are you going to take away the church from me now? You still want to take over the church, but right now your anger toward God shows all over you. In the pulpit, head home with your family. We're going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. Yes, you will. But what happens when a member loses someone and they need God's word to bring them comfort? Who's going to give it to them? You? I don't know what to say to you. Except that now we both know what it's like to lose a son. 
I'm not being blasphemous. I'm not comparing myself to you. It's just that if I stop believing now, I won't be able to keep going. I won't survive. I hope you're going to explain this to me very soon. So until then, you're going to have to listen to me swear and curse and shout, and I won't be asking for your forgiveness. Sorry about that. But then she just asked for forgiveness. <laughs> no, uh, the reason I liked both of those clips, um, because they, they sound real, right? When something happens, especially... The, I, I can't imagine losing a child and how hard that would be. It's hard enough to lose other loved ones, right? But to be a child, but to lose a child would be horrible. Um, but I like that in both of those cases, you have a person that's speaking over the, the first guy that wants to be the pastor, and he says, you will be, but first you got to get this stuff out of you. It takes him from a place of anger to a place of potential vulnerability to where he can address that with God. Because as long as he just stays angry, the enemy has him where he wants him, right? Because he's not letting God enter into it. He's staying mad. And what I loved about the second clip is she's taking it right where she needs to. She's taking it right to God, and she's leaving it there, and she's being vulnerable in front of him, and she's speaking her heart because God already knows it anyway. right? And so it puts her in a place that he can start doing work again in her life, and getting her to that place where she can find contentment after something horrible, and of the man after something horrible has happened, eventually they can get back there. And the reason that I wanted to go in that direction was part of the year I've been having. You know, I lost my brother at Christmas time, which I've talked about on the air, and then I lost his wife, my sister in law, um, about five months later. And probably for one of the first times in my life, when I've lost somebody close to me or a couple people close to me, it didn't go there, right? It didn't go to the place where I was mad at God. I was never upset with God over it. I was very full of grief. My heart was broken, but there was no anger towards God because I know God's heart hurt as well. You know, of course, hopefully, you know, my brother's there with him, my sister-in-law's there with him, and, you know, they're getting to enjoy life without any pain and all that kind of stuff. But for me, it was a real victory. You know, I still have to deal with the grief and I'm still dealing with it, but it was a real victory that I didn't let the enemy put it in a position where it was between God and I, all right? Because that's what his whole goal is from the Garden of Eden all the way back. He's trying to send two messages to you. God's got holding out on you or he's going to turn his back on you and you can't trust his heart. And that's what he tries to do. And he knows when he can get you there, he takes you away from the life line, you know, that that life preserver is not going to be able to reach you right? That you're not going to catch it. It's going to be there. God's going to throw it, but you're going to ignore it or you're not going to see it because you're so full of rage and you're full of other things. And, and so I think it's important to know that if that's where you find yourself today, that you're angry with God, that's okay. He's big enough. He can handle that, but just don't stay there. Tell him about it. Let him hear it, right? And then he'll start to work more fully in your life because you'll start to let him in because those cracks We'll let the light in and let him find some life in there. And so I just encourage you, wherever you're at today, to, to know that he's working hard to try to reach out to his loved, loving daughter, his loving son that he loves dearly. But uh, he's there for you. So that's where I went with the clip. Um, now we're going to transition over to Harold's clip, and then we'll do get to Rodney's clip after that. So, Harold, yours is from one of the best movies ever, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Secondhand lines. I got to thank my buddy Andy for for getting this one because uh, I was not able to get a clip and he got this one for me. But it's a great scene. Uh, Walter, the little little boy, is calling to try to catch up with his mother who told him she was going to be taking a class to be able to become, I think, a court stenographer. That's correct, yeah. And, uh, of course, she had lied to him and she couldn't be found. So he's going to run away. And so Garth and Hub are tracking him down, and that's what you'll hear in this, and how how they try to deal with him. Yeah. And, and we find contentment on both sides of the coin. Yeah, if you haven't seen it in the movie, the only thing, other thing they reference in the clip is uh, Garth and Hub have a lot of money, and so their family keeps coming uh-huh. around trying to take the money, and, and one of them's with them riding in the car, so you'll hear some of that, so just for context, but here we go. 
needs a good map. That's oh, let me get back to the beginning of it because you would enjoy that more, <laughs> I think, if we did that. So let's try that. I don't know why you have to drive. It's my car. Stop whining. We find a kid, he's gonna get a piece of my mind. There he is. Lawyer, stay in the car. Up, come on. No, no, you, not me, no. Well, get out of the car. Landing your next move. Where you figure I'm going? Here. Here you code 406. Montana. How come you're you're not heading to uh, Fort Worth where your mama is? She's not there. She lied. Again. Listen, kid. Uh, we know you got your heart set on going to Montana, but uh, it's late. Hub, help me out here. Why? Sounds like his mind's made up. Good luck in Montana, kids. We got better maps than that one at the house, right, Hub? Yeah, man, he's a good map, that's for sure. Sure. I've been to the orphan home before. I don't want to go back. The kid, it ain't our fault you got a lousy mother. Guess I should get going. Which way is north? Uh, uh, listen, kid, uh, do us a favor. If you come back to the house and stay a while, why, our relatives are going to hate it. I, I bet they hate it so much, they go away and leave us all alone. It's crazy enough, it just mm -hmm. might work. Sure. Come on, kid. Help us out here. Guess I could come back for a while. Seeing it's so important. Yeah, they do a great job of, of making the boy think that he's the one doing the help. But it ends up that these old guys become very attached to the young man and he brings a lot of contentment into their life. Yeah, there, it's, you know, when I first heard about the movie, uh, one of the guys I was working with told me about it and it sounded just kind of hokey. And it's, it really became one of my favorite movies uh, of all time. Just the, 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 the effect that people have on one another's lives. Because, you know, they're very, no one's content. Hub's definitely not content. Walter's not content. Maybe, maybe Garth is, you know, a little bit more content than the rest of them. But because of the love and because of the, 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 the way they mature together in the relationship, there, there's healing and there's contentment that's found. And it's a really, it's a really good movie. And it's pretty funny at times too. Yeah. Great movie. Yeah. Andy, you got anything you want to add about the movie? You got nothing? I just like to put you on the spot. You know how that is. Yeah. So I can say thesaurus. Th 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 thesaurus, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I put myself out there again. You did. I appreciate man. your effort. You get an A for effort. No, Hub, you know, in that he was the one that was kind of, he didn't really want a, the kid to come around. But in movie later in the movie, he really, you can see an affection for the kid and um Walter and and just the connection that they have but again it started out where he was just the kid seemed to be in an annoyance you know yeah. and not not something that he didn't want to invest the time or, eff, or effort into him but it was so funny you know as you hear the, the plot twist or whatever where it was like Hub did want to get out from under that greedy uh, cousin or whatever that was there. And he was like, oh, yeah, kid come live with us. Will he go away? Yeah, I'll go for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now I can find the benefit <laughs> right. in that, right? Rodney, that brings us up to you. Here we go. Yeah, I don't think there's a real big evidence of what's going on in in this clip inside of everything else that's going on here. What we've got is a man, uh, Vody Bachman, he's talking about his life now going into this church and what he's going to do, what he's going to be, where he's going to go with this. And the hardest part to get out of anybody is what are you doing next? What are you, what are you going to go to? Where are you going to go? And he talks into that with this first couple minutes here of this talk where he can kind of just lean into it and start to start to tell a little bit about where he's going to go. 
during the introduction when he said, you know, there's a, a, a lot of degrees from a, a lot of places. And, and he pointed out just he pointed out just one place. And the one place he pointed out was the University of Oxford in England. Yes, I studied there. But you know what they call a fire-breathing, gospel-preaching, six-day creationist who studied at Oxford? <laughs> An idiot. <laughs> You're marginalized because you might have an education, but it's not the right education unless you're operating from the accepted worldview. One of the ways that they marginalize us is they continually march out people who name the name of Christ, but believe little and practice less. They love to march these people out. If you are part of an organization that names the name of Christ, and they love to bring people like that out into the public eye so that they can say, look, look, here are some Christians who are not wide-eyed idiots. Here are some Christians whose worldview is aligned with ours. Here are some Christians who are Marxists. Here are some Christians who support abortion, who support same-sex marriage, who support, here, here they are right here. These other people out there are the narrow-minded bigots. And so we're marginalized, particularly in our day. We're marginalized if we don't toe the line on some very specific issues. One of those I've already alluded to is creation and evolution. If you believe that there's a God who created the world, you're marginalized. And there's no way for us to come in and talk about the marginalization and where we're at if we don't actually get into where we're at in the world. Where are we at compared to where other people are at and how is this interacting between us? So that's one of the things where we have to make sure that we are out there still speaking the truth and talking about the things that are going on in the world without just coming in and just settling and letting them talk because then we're going to get run over from the beginning. Robbie, so I, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I just had a, you know, personal experience. In this. <laughs> so I was struggling with some kidney stones that apparently were chasing one another, um, mm. according to the <laughs> report I got later. Anyway, it was a real painful situation, and I'd had them, you know, previously about three months before that. So this is getting a little old, you know, and uh, I remember climbing into bed and going, <laughs> really. <laughs> are we here again? Do we really have to do this? Because it is just incredibly painful, right? And uh, it, it was dark in the room, and I was not in a good place because I was navel gazing, as my friend Harold would <laughs> yeah, say. Yeah. I was looking at my lint and my belly button, and it was painful. And uh, I, I glanced up at the ceiling, and, and you know, I've stayed in this bedroom, I don't know, for five years since my dad died, whatever. And I look up, and there's a ceiling fan up there, and it is throwing a shadow, and it was pitch dark in a room, but it was throwing a shadow of a cross on the roof that was just, just took my breath. You know, like I just saw him, you know, as you were talking about, he was there all along. He was right there, and he was just winking at me like, I'm right here. I'm, you know, I'm right with you. And, and I can't even, there's no explaining the amount of, like you went from this unbelievable amount of grief and pain and chaos like we've been talking about throughout the show just going, oh, man, thank you. I know you are. You know, it was just awesome. Yeah. Well, we have plenty of time to talk more about contentment <laughs> or anything else you guys want to talk about. Well, that, that makes me think. I mean, and I don't want to share the same story, but it was very similar. It was back in December of uh, 22 when Mom passed. Um, it was the same time I was going through kidney stones. And she passed, and I was trying to plan for the... Uh, funeral and I'm like what else God you know and I had an appointment I had to go make that day and I just they had taken out the catheter and it, and it wasn't doing right and I was just it was excruciating and I could not get peace I could I was I was just tormented in pain and and I remember just laying down and trying to be still and, and he came to me and he said be still and know that I'm God and shortly thereafter I fell asleep and then I woke up 
few hours later with no pain, and I haven't felt that pain again since. And it is, he comes to us in those times, not to always make things, just make it easy, make the pain go away instantly. He can give you a, a cross sign, you know, in the on the ceiling, or you, he can do something like that. But he's gracious in those situations. Um, and that contentment, I believe that's growth. I, I think if you, I've heard Rodney talk about it a bunch on here, about the impact of the wild heart message and the gospel of that he wasn't a very content person and neither, neither was I and how God steps in through your maturity, through your pain, he sh- proves that he's there. And that's the big thing. He proves that he's there in a variety of ways. And when he does, I think that that, that truly can bring on that contentment because you know, it, it, that context of we're at a, a, we're a, it's a great love story, we're in war while we're at it but you have all that and and you just can be content in knowing that he's got it you know yeah the life is not going to be easy but you got somebody with you it uh i agree um but it's hard when you're in the middle of it right it's hard to have that vision uh i've been battling some health stuff you know and uh last couple days were really good and then all of a sudden tonight not so good and it's just frustrating, you know, and yeah, I know God's got it. He's in control. But at the end of the day, you're just still just tired of it. You're tired of whatever you're dealing with. I'm tired of financial troubles. I'm tired of health issues. I'm tired of fill in the blank. You know, I'm tired of feeling this way or hurting or grieving or whatever it might be. And it's hard to have perspective. So what do people do, you know, when they're in the middle of that? Right. Because sometimes it's hard to see the forest through the trees. Right. And so I think that's a saying. I think I said that right. But, uh, you know, what do people do in the midst of it? Yeah, they know, okay, eventually it's going to be okay. But right now it doesn't feel that way. It's hard to remember that your objective was draining the swamp when you're up to your elbows and alligators. Yeah. True. I don't know if I ever told this story or not, but um, I told it the other day to some guys and. I was at an event out in uh, Tennessee one time. It was a ministry event. And the pastor that was up there called all the ordained evangelists to the stage, and which included me. So I went to the stage, and he's, we're up on this. I mean, this is like a church, 2,000 people in there or whatever. And I think so. We're all up on the stage, probably 50 or 60 of us. And he starts praying for people and touching them on the head, and they're falling out. I'm talking about falling out. And he comes to me, and he touches me, and I don't fall out. And I'm sitting there with my eyes closed. You know, we're supposed to be praying and that kind of thing. And so when I open my eyes, it looked like Jonestown the morning after. Everybody has fallen out but me. And the enemy whispered, you know, because I've struggled with identity issues and, and insecurity issues all my life. And I'm standing there looking around, and I can hear the voices going, yeah, there's something wrong with you. And I'm standing there, and I'm telling you, there's bodies all around me and and I think so I just kind of just look around and I just step over some people and go back to my seat. And I am just in the middle of chaos because I don't know how to process this. And so I go to bed and I'm thinking, I want to go home. And we still got a whole other day there or whatever and I think. And I just don't want to be around anybody. And, I mean, the enemy had taken me out. And next morning, I get up and I'm supposed to go to another session thing. And, and I look out this little gazebo, and there's a friend of mine that came with us on the trip. He's sitting out there, and he and I had done a lot of different stuff together. And we're sitting there, and he goes, last night. And when he said that, I thought, oh, God, here it comes. He's going to go, what happened to you? But that's not what he said. He said, when I looked up there, and you were the only guy standing up there, he said, God told me right then and there. He said, you see that? There's the last man standing. You can count on him when you can't count on nobody else. And it just flipped the whole script in my life because we see things wrong. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we as I heard a few weeks ago, a guy prayed, Lord, where I have learned you wrong, correct me. And that's been kind of my prayer the past two weeks. Lord, if I've learned you wrong somewhere in my discontentment, in my chaos, Show me the right way to look at you. because, And that's why he puts people in our lives, and that's why there's friction and that kind of thing, because he's trying to correct our vision. 
Mm. So, yeah, definitely things that you can pray for. Another way of saying that is perspective, right? Having the right perspective or having the right context, you know, or just God, you may not give me either one of those, but how do I step into a place of trust? You know, when I, when I don't, I don't think you're abandoning me, but it feels like I'm all alone. Yeah. Right. And, and that's a dangerous place where the enemy can say, okay, yep, you see God's not there. Right. And again, that's his goal, but just, you know, at least saying, I don't even know how to pray about this God, but you do. And so just guide me in this. Yeah. Well, what also, also should, should give us comfort here. I go stumbling on my words, but, uh, is really when you look at the Bible, I mean, it's it was all over the place. Guys didn't have it easy, you know, guys and girls. I mean, there was they t- lived tough lives. I mean, there was truly th- difficult things that they had to come through. Paul being one who, who has most of the quotes on being content, I mean, look at what his life was. So it is a state of mind and a state of heart much more than it is the condition of your life. And I think there are times, and I said it earlier in the show, that it's okay to be frustrated. Oh, no doubt. Right? You know, look at David. No, absolutely. Right? No. And, and he was all over the place. That sometimes yeah. he was incredibly happy and sometimes not so much. Well, it, it gets into that whole thing of, of letting God work you through the whole process. Terry, you got something you want to add? Yeah, yeah, just a second, guys. I, you know, I've been dealing with the thing of self-control for a while. And I think my contentment comes when I can control myself. Okay? Does that make sense to you guys? Mm-hmm. It doesn't. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you have to go through to actually gain that thing. You know, everything comes with a struggle. You know, I think it says what that um, these things come to strengthen you. So I think self control is my my thing of of contentment when I right. can control myself. Yeah, it's having that discipline. Yes. Right, Robbie, you got something to add? Uh, yeah, it's actually a gift. Self control is it's yeah, a absolutely. gift to the spirit. It is. It, it's really a cool gift. And, you know, the others come first. <laughs> you know, but, but really, Robbie, and I know we're short, um, oh. I don't think we can do the others without self-control. Yeah. Talk to you next week. Amen. Masculinejourney.org and Love Somebody Well this week. This is The Truth Network.